since we're at the beginning of Lent, um, I thought it would be apropos for me to speak about one of the most important uh, icons in, uh, France, in the Franciscan world. Uh, it, it's a painting, a, a painted crucifix, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, and um, it was not painted by any Franciscan. We don't know its date. We don't know its origin. We just know it was hanging in the little church of San Damiano. This is, uh, this is San Damiano today. Actually, the, um, the road here today is paved. That's a kind of, I don't know if that's a paved road. It doesn't look like it. But this, this would have been the original structure where this crucifix uh, was uh, hanging during Francis's time. The crucifix is six feet, ten and a half inches tall, four feet, three and a half inches wide. Uh, so it's quite large. Um, there is uh, a crucifix in the, the little city of Spoleto, which is about 30 or 40 minutes south of Assisi. And uh, that crucifix has a date on it and the artist's name. And if I, I don't have a great photo of it, but later on when we get to that, uh, uh, I'll ask if we can open it. And it has a lot of similarities, very close similarities to this crucifix, especially in the body of Christ, which has no halo. And the way the hair is designed on the icon, it comes down sort of in curls over the shoulder, if you will. Uh, and that crucifix was painted by Alberto Sozio in 1187. Now, Francis is born in 1182, so these, that crucifix certainly uh, was done right after Francis um, was born, or before Francis was born, sorry, after. And this crucifix hanging here, we have no date on it, but uh, we Franciscans have claimed it as, um, uh, if you will, a symbol of our uh, solidarity and recognition in the world. So this crucifix has been picked up by many different churches uh, for different reasons. People who have what they call Teze prayer uh, in different parishes will use it as a center of focus. Uh, so the crucifix is rather important to us. So Francis was praying here in this little church. Um, the church today, everything around it comes from about the 15th or 16th century. The only thing that existed in Francis' day would be this oval window, get rid of the porticos, and there's a line up in the, in the architecture going up this way and this way, and that would have been the original little chapel that belonged to the Diocese of Assisi. Uh, today, uh, the Franciscans uh, are there, and we came to its ownership in 1982 of this place. Uh, when Italy became a country in 1870 and they confiscated all church lands, a Scottish marquis bought San Damiano uh, and in 1982, the 800th anniversary of Francis' birth, they gave the deed back to us. So we only owned it for a little over maybe 20, 30 years, if you will. Um, and the crucifix would have hung in here, but today it does not hang here. So uh, as we go into it, Francis, as you, this is a, a painting by Giotto, which is in the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. Pictures Francis here, uh, kneeling before the crucifix. The, the, the fresco was somewhat damaged, you can see that. Um, but also they're trying to show that the church was a bit dilapidated at the time. And Francis is at the beginning of his conversion process. And as he's, he's in prayer here, before the crucifix, um, he hears inside of himself, Francis, go repair my church, which you see is falling into ruin. And that church was dilapidated. So Francis takes it literally and begins to repair the church. Now, studies have been done as to what did he possibly do. Now, that's another whole lecture. Archaeologically, I can do it, but I don't want to do it now. I'm tempted, but I won't touch it. Okay? I really am tempted. It's, it's very interesting material. And he could not have done it alone. Otherwise, he really would have had to been uh, in, in the construction business. And we know he was not in the construction business. But um, uh, he heard this message, go repair my church. So he starts repairing San Damiano. He repairs 
what we call the portiumpla, the little portion, a little chapel down in the swamp in the valley that the Benedictines had. And when Francis gets brothers, the Benedictines said, oh, you can have it. And Francis took it. The Benedictines wanted to unload it because in the swamp, it was surrounded by snakes and, and mosquitoes. So you were dealing with malaria. And the Benedict Benedictines didn't want to come down there anymore for mass from up on Mount Subasio. So we got it. And he repaired a third church. And I, after the third church, he got the message that God didn't call me to be a construction worker. God called me to repair the church, but the church as the people of God. So he begins a different phase of his conversion. Please. This is the crucifix of, of uh, San Damiano as it hangs today in the Basilica of St. Clair. You will see uh, shortly um, another uh, picture of it when it was under glass with a very dull type background to it. But what they did was they, they've hung it here and you can see the two wires kind of holding it. Um, it's, um, I told you, six foot ten this way, four feet, three and a half, if you will. It's, um, it's an icon painted on cloth. And if you look closely, you see the nails. You can see where I'm pointing, a nail, a nail. They nailed it to the cross. Uh, and it's, uh, I think, the, the, oh, the wood is oak, if you will. Um, and it, it, it was hanging in the little church of San Damiano. Now, if this were hanging in San Damiano today, as a six foot ten crucifix, it's too, too large for the chapel, it's too tiny. But the, the room above the chapel did not exist in Francis' day. So when you would have walked into San Damiano in Francis' day, you would have looked directly to the ceiling. And with the height from the floor to the ceiling, uh, through the dormitory that's there today, the crucifix would have fit well in that church. And we're going to take a look at each piece of the crucifix to pick up a little bit of the spirituality and the theology. So Francis has this conversion moment around 1205-06. He's about 23, 24, 25 years old at that time. And he has the conversion experience before this crucifix. Claire, later on, around 1211, 1212, goes to live at San Damiano. She will have the opportunity to sit before this crucifix for 41 years. So to understand her uh, spirituality, it's important to understand the icon that she uh, sat before. And of course, icons have a whole, if you will, ritual around, they don't call it the painting of an icon, but they call it the writing of an icon. So there's a whole rich uh, uh, ritual uh, that uh, goes into producing something so beautiful as this. Let me also say it while we're now looking at the crucifix. In the 13th century, this is the only type of crucifix that Francis or Claire would have known, painted crucifixes. There was no three-dimensional crucifix. I don't see any in the room here. But you see crosses today with the body of Christ in, uh, just in three dimensions. It's, it's, it's out from the wood of the cross, okay? That first appears in the early 1300s. When the Franciscans began to preach the passion of Christ, uh, the more they preached it, you, you'll notice that the Christ figure is erect on the cross. But as the friars begin to preach about the passion, they, they, the artist begins uh, portraying Jesus' body as twisting and contorting, and as that happens, the figures are knocked off the cross, the panels of the cross, to ultimately to the point where artists began producing a cross or a crucifix only with the body of Christ on it in three dimensions. At the end, I will show you several of the extant crucifixes of the 13th century. So they, they had no clue of a three-dimensional crucifix as we know it today. This would have been the older version of, of the way it was set. In, it's today in the Basilica of St. Clair. Now, how did it get in the Basilica of St. Clair? Well, St. Clair died down at San Damiano in 1253 in August. And they immediately took her body from down at San Damiano into the city walls. We have security systems today. We just had our Sloman system worked on in our friary. 
okay? We have security systems. They had no security system against enemies. And the sisters were living outside the city walls. So when the city would have been invaded, uh, th th those who were inside the city walls were safer. And since St. Clair somehow miraculously preserved the sisters from a, a siege of some mercenary so soldiers, about 1240, they, the citizens felt that while she's down there, they're safe. When she died in 1253, they immediately took her body into the city walls, also because she was considered a saint. Now, I have to get crass about this. Uh, if you have a saint's body, you have the economy of the city. Because pilgrims are going to come. Visitors are going to come. Each year in Assisi, go about 2 million people. And that town is, I mean, this section of Brooklyn is larger than Assisi. Just put around the college area, maybe over to Borough Hall and maybe over to Livingston Street. As Assisi is tiny, but their whole economy today depends on two corpses. And if they didn't have them, if those corpses were stolen, okay, they would have lost the economy. And Perugia was their enemy. I'll just give you an aside. Uh, about maybe 20 years ago, in, in, uh, in Rome, there is uh, at the church of St. Bonaventure on the Palatine, uh, the body of, of one brother by the name of Blessed uh, Bonaventure of Barcelona. So the, he died in Rome and he was a blessed, and the people of Barcelona asked if they could borrow the body for a festival. So Rome sent it and the Spanish never sent it back. <laughs> so you can see, there's still this idea of dealing with the corpses of holy people. And it was the same back then. So if this is, you can't tell, but it's kind of uh, dull. It's behind glass with an, uh, I'm colorblind, I don't know the color of the curtain behind it, but it was ugly. And I'm glad they got rid of it. Please, can you, pardon? It's blue, okay. Um, again, we're back to, uh, the way it hangs in San Damiano today. St. Francis composed a little prayer before any crucifix, and especially this crucifix. Uh, and his favorite name for God was, he liked to call God in Italian, Altissimo. That means you're the most high exalted person I could think of. So he begins his prayer, um, Altissimo Glorioso Dio, most high, glorious God, cast your light into the darkness of my heart. Give me right faith, firm hope, perfect love, wisdom and perception, so that I can carry out your holy and true command. And that was the prayer he utters uh, before this crucifix, if you will. Now, as we look at the crucifix, you notice the body is not contorted. It's uh, standing upright there on the cross with its arms stretched out. And the theology behind this cross is mostly drawn from the Gospel of John. So it's Johannine theology there. And it's in the Gospel of John where Jesus makes the statement, I am the light of the world. This uh, depiction of the body of Christ is, is called by artists luminous. It's almost full of light, if you will, and inviting people uh, to come before him, to come to the light. Now, as I'm talking about the light, look beneath his arms, you see the dark space there, and the dark space here. That dark space uh, symbolically represents his tomb. So you've got light contrasted with darkness on the crucifix. In this crucifix, he shows no sign of, of pain because actually he's not hanging. It's more of a, a triumphant type of crucifix, if I could use that expression. For St. Francis, the victory of Jesus Christ, and we celebrate this every year, and um, for many, many years, for me, after you go through the passion of Jesus Christ, for me the victory is always, he walks out of the tomb. Okay? 
but the victory for Francis is on Good Friday. The victory is when Jesus Christ, by his death, if you will, the instant that Jesus dies, and Francis envisions him transitioning immediately into the arms of his father, and this is in the Gospel of John, because John, uh, Jesus says, Father, I ask that you glorify, and you glorify me at once. And as he dies, he's instantly glorified. And St. Francis writes about this. And Jesus, if you will, immediately uh, is, is uh, back in the arms of his father in the instant of death. So for Francis, the moment of death is when uh, Jesus uh, returns to the father, is glorified, and again takes all of humanity and offers humanity back to God, if you will, and away from the evil one or Satan or the devil, whatever word you want to put on that. For St. Francis, that's the moment of victory, when humanity is presented back to God. So Francis celebrates the victory with the cross. So the body of Christ is portraying that here, uh, if you will. And I know just one more thing, uh, Mary, I hope you don't mind if I mention your husband, but um, I, I, first thing I said when I came in this room, didn't I come to a wake here? We had a wake here for Frank Macchiarolo. I'm an Italian. When we have a wake, we're morose. We're very sad. I mean, everybody's sad, you know, uh, at a wake. So when the, the day a person dies is a day of gloom for us. But... The day that Jesus died, the church calls it good. Not bad Friday, but good Friday. You catch the adjective. Because it is the victory of Jesus Christ presenting humanity back to God. And Jesus, Francis imagines this in his office of the Passion. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, as Francis has it in his meditation, as Jesus is glorified by God, Jesus almost comes out with the statement, right going through the moment of death, and glorifying and saying, Wow, I am God. I am God. And for Francis, that's the victory. So the victory is on the Friday that he called, that the church calls good. And so it's portrayed in the figure of the light. Now we look at it more closely here. The face of Jesus, serene, calm. According to traditional iconography, the eyes are large. You can see that. The mouth is small. The ears are almost invisible. Why? Because in the contemplation of the Father, God the Father, in glory, words are no longer necessary, and there is nothing to listen to, if you will. Jesus' eyes are open and looks at all the generations of people, if you will. And this face is the face that Francis and Claire would have contemplated. Um, and and, and when, it's interesting, when Francis writes his rule and, and speaks to us friars who preach, he says, make your words short. Was I short in Assisi? <laughs> you who traveled with me, I don't think I was all the time. Make your words short, almost coming like from the shut mouth. In the presence of God, almost silence is enough, if you will. Next. And you notice that um, we don't have the crown of thorns on this crucifix. Again, because it's a crucifix of victory. It's a crucifix of light. It's a crucifix of resurrection. Uh, and instead of... Uh, the crown of thorns and his hair kind of messy. Notice the, the curls that they seem to have stylized for him. Certainly that's not the way it was on the cross. But this is the iconographer. The person who's writing this icon, if you will. And they, they have the nimbus or the, the halo here. And by the way, uh, it, it is painted, but the, nim the halo and the head are out of the painting. They come forward. And when you look at it from the side, you can actually see the, the wood of the halo supporting it uh, behind, if you will. You can't see that here. Can you go to the next one? Now, right above the head, we have two lines, which um, are uh, the Latin, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. 
<clears throat> when Jesus is brought before Pilate, and um, he, he, Pilate asks the people, am I to crucify your king? And they said, we have no king but Caesar. They didn't want him as, as king, you know? And Pilate almost uh, derogatorily, uh, and to taunt the people of Jerusalem, I think. I think it was to taunt them. He, put, he hangs on the crucifix, not only in Latin, but Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. He hangs it in three languages. Yet these are the, the, This is the name of Jesus. It looks like IHS. Nazare. Um, only, we know this is the Gospel of John because John's the only one that mentions Nazareth in the sign that was put over his head. And, and king of the Jews. And of course the people in Jerusalem, the leaders in Jerusalem, did not want that sign there. And they, beseech, they besought Pilate to get rid of it, and Pilate refused. Pilate was stubborn, I think, on certain things, if you will. So that's directly above his head, as it would have been on the cross. Please? This part of the icon is precious. First of all, you see Jesus somewhat within a circle, but not completely. The circle, uh, in iconography, the circle is a symbol of perfection. So Jesus, being a perfect figure, they paint him in a circle, but humanity cannot even envision his perfection, so consequently, he's partially out of it. He's beyond the circle, beyond what even humanity tries to imagine as perfection. He's ascending uh, back to his father, supposedly, as scripture says, 40 days after he, he died, uh, after he rose, excuse me, from the dead. He ascended back to his father, and almost he seems dynamically to be stepping. If you notice the way the feet are drawn, he's not drawn straight standing up, but he's kind of stepping into paradise, holding a golden cross, now a symbol uh, of his victory. Again, victory over Satan, over evil. And welcoming him here are angels, please. Uh, they are angels. It's hard to see because we can't get the pictures sometimes too good. But these are wings back here. Back here, here. It's, it's hard to see it. But you can see being welcomed by almost like a choir of angels, if you will. And let's go one more. And the half circle above is supposedly, again, the symbol of, of God, of divinity, of perfection. Uh, this is supposed to be the hand of God the Father blessing Jesus for accomplishing redemption uh, through his passion and death on the cross. Now, the way the fingers are painted there, uh, two fingers pointing out uh, and three uh, kind of uh, into the palm of the hand. The two fingers pointing out are, they say, might be able to symbolize the, uh, the two natures of Jesus. Because they said Jesus was both human and divine. So the symbolism of the two fingers is the, the two natures of Jesus. And the three into the palm would be a symbol of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there is another interpretation on it. And this is artistic uh, interpretation, if you will, on the icon that um, in, a, in a hymn to the Holy Spirit in Latin they would sing Digitus Paterne Dextere the, 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 the finger of the, of the right hand of God and some say that's simply uh, a symbol of the Holy Spirit okay now we come to the extremities of the cross, and it's fascinating. I, I, I love this section very much. Notice how the blood is shown, falling down on the angels beneath, so the blood of Christ redeems all. Even though this latest translation of the Catholic Missal changed the consecration formula. It used to say for all, and now it says for, for many. I, I don't know. I don't know agree with the many thing, but that's what I have to pray. So the blood is falling on those beneath here. The dark back here, especially here, darker, is the tomb. Here, and you're going to see on the other side, you have the two women coming to the tomb 
on Easter Sunday morning. Notice she's pointing to the dark area, to the tomb, uh, and she and they supposedly met the angels. Now, this icon is in Italy. Now, I you know Italians, and I'm Italian backdrop myself. We can't talk without our hands moving. Your hands have to move. I, I, notice their hands. They're having a conversation, and their hands are all in some excited motion, ready to try to s say something, if you will. But the angel supposedly meeting the two women and telling them he's not here, he's risen as he said. Um, if you can go to the other side of that. You have something uh, similar here, um, as you saw on the other side of the crucifix. Just trying to see if there's any other notes that I wanted to give you here on that. I don't think so. Let me just point out artistically something to you. Notice that the border is a scallop shell. See it? That border uh, is the, the shell. Uh, um, if you, I don't know if anybody, have any of you been to Compostela? St. James in Compostela? Or did you see uh, Martin Sheen's movie, The Way? Yeah. If you remember, they would have the shell. The shell is taken from the shrine of St. James in Compostela, and the shell is the symbol of a pilgrim. So uh, it's, it's portraying the notion of pilgrim uh, by, by the shell. And why a shell? Because that was used by pilgrims to scoop up water. There was no other way to get water while they were on pilgrimage. So they used the shell to scoop it up or to eat from. If it was big enough, they would eat from it. This is what we would today, I think, call a scallop shell. But notice also the filigree border here on the inside of the crucifix. That's not usually uh, noted uh, by too many people. But the artist <coughs> had some very fancy work going on here. Please, next. So we've looked at the top of the crucifix and the extremities of the cross beam. Let me mention to you one thing about the cross beam here. The cross beam is always carried by the person who's going to be executed to the place of execution. That was what the Romans did. The cross beam weighed an average of 108 pounds. So you can see, when they talk about the passion of Jesus, he fell under the cross beam. And they get this man, Simon of Cyrene, they force him to help Jesus carry the cross. Because the cross beam was very The cross beam would have been roped to him across his back. Now, uh, another thing you've got to remember, he was already scourged. That's uh, 40 lashes less one. And the whole back would have been ripped open. But it's not only that Jesus would have been scourged, every condemned Ro prisoner in the Roman Empire was scourged. They began the, the dying process with the scourging. And it was quite sadistic. Uh, any of you seen uh, Gibson's film, The Passion? Yes. It's a graphic, graphic scene. More than likely pretty accurate at that point. Except for Mary mopping it up afterwards. That's somebody's private meditation. It's not in the Gospels. Okay? So you got a sense of, of that. Now we're going to look down the lowest section of the crucifix, please. Under his arms are five figures, five large figures. And you got two small ones, one here, and I can't see the other one there, we'll see him later. There's two small ones, okay? In iconography, if you are for Jesus, they paint you large. If you're against them, they paint you small. Now, we'll talk about this guy in a minute, and the other guy on the other side. But these five figures, notice the blood coming from his side, beginning to fall on this person. Can we go to the first set, please? Okay, this is under Jesus' right arm. We have directly against the body of Jesus, which is certainly not that way, but it's portrayed that way by the artist, if you will, trying to get all the figures onto the, the, the wood of the cross, is uh, the evangelist John. John was the youngest of the apostles, probably um, in, at, in his adventure years. Um, I don't know how many students are here, but most of your students would have been in the same the same age as John, when John was uh, a, a disciple. And it's interesting that the iconographer paints John almost attached to the body of Jesus. 
recalling at the Last Supper that at one point John kind of, they didn't sit at table on chairs. They sat at a very low table, sort of on a, a, a rug or so, and they ate more in a reclining position. And at one point John rests his head on Jesus' chest. He wanted to hear something because there was some, some little rumble going on amongst the twelve. Uh, Jesus said something about being betrayed, and John wants to ask him, who is it? But John rests on his head at the Last Supper, so he's painted, if you will, almost attached to the body of Jesus. His mother Mary, here, portrayed with her left hand beneath her chin. She's not tired. Her left hand beneath the chin, in iconography, the symbol that's carried is, uh, it connotes either sorrow, astonishment, or reflection. Now, more than likely, the artist is trying to convey sorrow here, if you will, uh, at this horrific scene. And notice both of them are pointing with their right hands to Jesus Christ, as, as, as if to say, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We've got to keep our lives fixed on Jesus. Can we go to the other side, please? You have three figures here uh, on this side. Uh, two women and one man. Uh, and first of all, the woman, uh, very close to the body of Jesus, is Mary Magdalene. In the 13th century, the way she was interpreted in the scriptures, they interpreted her uh, as the prostitute of the scripture. Okay? The one that Jesus dealt with. Now, uh, the, today's ex ex exegesis on Mary is not that. It's certainly not that. But nevertheless, that's what they believed up to the 13th century. And it's fascinating that, if, that they paint her attached to the body of Jesus, if she was the prostitute, she would have made her money off the bodies of men. But now she's attached to the body of Christ. So the body of Christ giving her life. Notice the left hand under her chin. Also, uh, uh, sorrow, astonishment or reflection. The woman in the middle, maybe we don't know her too well, but scripture calls her Mary of Clopas. Supposedly his mother's sister. So that makes Jesus her nephew. Now, we, we don't hear too much about the relatives of Jesus, only mother and father. Uh, when I went to Israel with a scripture scholar from the Catholic Theological Union of Chicago, uh, Carol Stumula, when we went to Nazareth, he, he was teaching, uh, teaching us about the early church in Nazareth after Jesus. And for the first almost 300 years, the leader of the church in Nazareth was a blood relative of Jesus. Isn't that fascinating? blood relative of Jesus. So that's Mary of Clopas. Um, she has her right hand raised, pointed to Jesus. Now this is the Roman centurion here. He has no halo, okay? Um, he seems to be holding the death scroll in his left hand. You see what I'm pointing to? And his hand seems to be symbolically raised, if you will, uh, with the, the, the two fingers up again, connoting um, the, the two natures of Jesus or the three fingers up connoting the Trinity and he makes the statement uh, truly this man was a son of God now we have notice this little head here okay he's going to come up later on but I, I think this is a better place to look at it this little head here there's at least three opinions of what that's about first opinion is the artist immortalized himself or herself. Second opinion is, um, it's a face in the crowd. Notice the other heads behind it. Can you see them? It's hard. They're little like arches, like heads. It's supposedly connoting the crowd. That's another opinion. A third opinion is, it would have been the centurion's son whom Jesus healed. So we don't know exactly what that is. Now, while we're here, and we'll probably see this again, let me talk about this little guy. If you're against Jesus, they paint you small. Now, he's wearing, he's, the garb that's painted on him is the garb of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin. And he seems to be painted in a stance of defiance. 
with his hand on his hip. And notice, now notice the faces of these three people. They are facing us directly, even the little guy here. But his face is in profile. Half of his face is in the dark, connoting by the iconographer that um, his opposition still leaves him somewhat in the dark. Notice there's, their names are written beneath them. Can you go back one quickly? See the names, Maria, Johannes, and then again, forward. And then um, there's another Maria here, and Centurion here, if you will, for these figures. Can we go to the next one? That's that little head up close. See him right there? And the other head's behind it. I couldn't get a better picture of it. And that's the Centurion's head. Please. And this is the little guy on the left side. Notice even his name is written near his legs. Actually, L-O-N-G-I-N-U, Longinus. Longinus holding the spear with which he's supposed to have pierced Christ's side after Jesus was dead. In St. Peter's in the Vatican, I don't know if you guys remember when you came with me, there were four colossal statues around the altar. Two men, two women. He was one of them, Longinus, and they claim to, in that reliquary near him, have, uh, have uh, the spear that pierced uh, Jesus uh, at the, at, after his death. So Longinus also painted small in the garb of the Romans because he would have been against Jesus. The next one. You can see the, uh, the uh, unknown figure here, no name but seeming to defy Jesus here, uh, if you will. Next. Now we go to the very bottom of the crucifix. You can see we're getting to the end. Not much longer. Um, there used to be other figures down here, and they conjecture three or four more. We know that these two are Peter and Paul. Uh, we know, and I can't, cannot see it clearly, they say Peter is holding a key there. So Peter is always symbolized by the key, where Jesus is supposed to have said to him, did say to him, and I will give you, you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and there might have been other figures here. Could have been the patron saints of the church where this was hung. That uh, It's not only the church of St. Damien, but it's Cosmos and Damien. These were twin brother saints who were um, doctors, if you will. So they could have been down here. And the patron saint of Assisi, by the way, who was not Francis nor Claire, it's Saint Rufinus. He's the, one of the first bishops who was martyred in 238 AD. Uh, and possibly Rufinus was down here. But from handling the cross, they've disappeared. Notice the feet up close, the blood coming down on those beneath. The redemption, if you will. Next. At the left leg of Jesus is a tiny rooster. See it? The cross has got a tremendous story to it. It's got the rooster there. Um, I went, the first time I went to the Philippines, I was uh, staying with the poor Claris in uh, Cebu, and uh, on the island of Cebu. And uh, you don't stay in the monastery. They put me out in the garden in kind of a shed. I, I, really, literally, like a little shed. And I was living in the shed. At 3.30, every rooster in Cebu woke up. It's the only time I wished I had a gun. <laughs> the, the, the rooster, the harbinger of the dawn. Now that's one of the symbolisms you can put here on the rooster. However, the rooster is directly over Peter down at the base of the crucifix. And the association is clear. From the denial of Peter, Jesus said to him, before the cock crows, Thrice, three times, you will deny me two times, if you will. So the, that, and the rooster, by the way, is placed at Jesus' left knee. The rooster always symbolizes the fall of Peter. And when we do fall, a lot of times we fall from the knees first. So the artist painted it right near the left knee of Jesus. Please. So I think we've explained all of the characters to you on the cross. This is a picture of Francis by Jocko that's in the Basilica of St. Francis. And it's, it's, it's an excerpt of a very large um, fresco. And what Francis is actually doing here is preaching to the birds. But 
the, the beauty of it is um, the, 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 the people who put this presentation together with all these photos felt it shows Francis in an act of contemplation. Almost just gazing. To contemplate is to see. To contemplate is to gaze. When you see, for example, first time you go to the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, or any beautiful aspect of creation, and you just look and you're riveted, that's a contemplative moment. And it's showing Francis here uh, to try to convey how much, how deeply and profoundly he um, contemplated this crucifix, if you will. And he took the challenge from it to repair the church. And when we read in his biography by Thomas of Chalama that Christ spoke to him, we can understand the, the meaning better of those words. And we ourselves can be challenged also and to take our part in the building up of the church in the school of Francis of Assisi. Next one. This is an aerial view of the city. This is Claire's Basilica where, where the uh, crucifix hangs today. Yeah, this is where San Damiano is. You notice the city wall? Notice San Damiano's outside the city wall down here. Uh, and this is where the crucifix is today. So her basilica is at this end and his basilica is at the other end. So they're kind of bookending the city. The city's not large, you can walk it in 30 minutes from one end to the other. And the major fortress that a bunch of you might have climbed up to. Please, the next. This is from below in the valley. See in the Basilica of St. Francis. If you would just continue that. Now, just want to show you a few more things before we close from crucifixes. This would be a three-dimensional crucifix. It's hanging in San Damiano in a side chapel done in the 17th century by um, a friar by the name of Innocent from the city of Palermo, Italy. You know, so notice it's really a graphically gory crucifix. So as the, they begin to preach about each aspect of the passion of Christ, artists began to try to portray it as graphically as they could. So you begin to see, this is 17th century. Francis and Claire would never have seen that. Please? You're going to see a series of seven painted crucifixes. Notice how the body's contorting here. On the Damiano crucifix, the body was exactly upright. Connoting victory, resurrection, victory. Next, please. Just keep going. This is hanging in the Basilica of St. Clair. It's of the middle of the 13th century. It was painted by the abbess who succeeded Clare. And she painted herself down here, by the way. She didn't paint it, but she had herself painted there. Next to Francis, kissing the feet of Jesus, if you will. Please, next. Another painted crucifix of the 13th century. You get an idea, this is all they would have known. When uh, Claire's mother, it says in her biography, uh, she was pregnant for the first time with Claire, she went to pray in a church before a crucifix for a safe delivery. Uh, the safety of women in childbirth in the 13th century was very low. She didn't think she would survive it. And she hears in prayer that you will safely give birth to a light. And the light uh, is conveyed by the name Chiara. And so she names her daughter Chiara. Next, another one. That might be at the Portiuncola in their museum. Another one. So you get a sense of this is all they would have known, please. Now this one I want to speak to you about. This is a Tao. Cross. Now, people who have studied crucifixions in the times of the Romans, uh, they said that one of the ways crucifixions was carried out is when the Romans would take a person to the place of crucifixion, the upright beam at times was already in the earth. And there would have been a groove in it, if I do it this way, a groove this way in it. No, this way would be good. This is the way it works. I don't know. There's a groove in it, okay? When 
the condemned person arrived at the place of crucifixion, they would throw the person on the ground, he's roped to the crossbeam, they let, let the person stay roped, and then they put the nails into the body, usually into the wrists, because that, then the body could be held better. Then they would lift the, body, the person up, so the person's bleeding profusely, and bring the person to the upright beam and just clamp it down into the groove. And so the cross looks like a T, the letter tau of the Greek alphabet and the Hebrew alphabet. If you, I don't think it's called tau in Hebrew. I don't know what you call it in Hebrew. But um, the, the, the tau crucifix, they say more than likely, was the method of crucifixion for Jesus. Now, this tau was drawn by St. Francis. That's Francis' handwriting, by the way, here. And he, it's, it's a blessing he gave to Brother Leo. He put it on parchment when they were at Mount uh, Laverna up in Tuscany. Of course, Leo was really uh, getting depressed up there. And Francis writes him this blessing and draws the towel. It seems to be rooted into the earth here, or people say it looks like sometimes a face, but I don't know about that. But this, uh, this towel, Francis would have learned about it from... Uh, pope Innocent III at the Fourth Lateran Council in Rome. And the Pope, when he called that council in 1215, he asked people to become champions of the town, become champions of the, the cross of Jesus Christ. So Francis picks it up and he draws it. Please, next. And th this is in Fonte Colombo, uh, a, a sanctuary where Francis spent time in solitude when they were renovating a chapel of the Magdalene of the 13th century. As they were doing the side window, they came across this red towel, and they've studied it, um, um, I forget what you call it, scientifically, let me just say that to you, and it dates back to the 13th century. So they attribute it to Francis. Next. Just another version of it, please. That's a clearer version of it. Now this cross, did any of you go to Laverna? You did? Okay, you remember that? Did you go down, all the way down the steps into Sasso Spico? Well, we, down, we went down about 80 steps, and we were in a very damp, cavernous area where Francis is supposed to have spent time in prayer. And the brothers, early on, they didn't have books to pray from. If you owned a Bible in the 13th century, a book like the Bible, uh, one of our Capuchin priests made a study on this in Rome that if you owned a Bible in the 13th century, it would cost the equivalent of 10,000 American dollars to own a Bible because it had to be copied out by hand. And uh, it was all on parchment. And parchment is sheepskin. So every Bible was a flock of sheep when you really think about it. Very expensive to have. And you had that beautiful display here recently at City Hall of the manuscripts. I, I saw it twice, okay? And you would have seen some, uh, some parchment of sheepskin they had in that uh, display. But the brothers didn't have the books, so, and they didn't have any crucifixes. They used to put two beams together like that, and they would sit and pray in meditation before it. Please, it's the same one, keep going to the point where Bonaventure ultimately writes that um, they didn't have books to read from, but the cross was their book. So that, please continue. I published meditations on this prayer of Francis a couple of years ago, and I gave it that title. And this is the cross also at La Verna, up on the main piazza as you overlook the, the valley, the Casentino Valley below it. Those are simple meditations on the, um, the prayer of St. Francis. i like to close um, with a little piece of St. Bonaventure. Uh, I was working on a, a, a manuscript of Bonaventures that I'm hoping to publish this year. And um, I came across, um, a, he had a footnote in it, but he, he didn't, he just gave a footnote reference. So I went to the check it out in the original text, and I found it 
It's, it's in, in his writing called Soliloquy. It's, it's just a mystical writing of his. And this is what Bonaventure writes about the cross. He says, Christ is waiting for you on the cross. His head is inclined for a kiss. His arms are spread out for an embrace. His hands are open in a gesture of giving. His body is stretched out in a position of total offering. His feet are attached so that he will remain with you. And his side is open to let you in. Amen. Thank you. When the earthquake hit in Italy. I was there when it hit in 1997. It was a terrible earthquake. We, four people were killed in the Basilica of St. Francis. And uh, the, uh, they, when they, the Basilica of St. Clair, the floor buckled. So they had to redo the whole floor. So they took the Damiano crucifix away. It took them five years to finish what they did there. The poor Clairs were having nervous breakdowns because the state took the crucifix. They didn't know where it was, and they didn't know if it was coming back. But they're formidable women. They got it back. <laughs>